Um, okay, so today we're going to cover a giant topic, uh, measurement error and missing data. Um, this is a topic that frequently gets ignored um, in a lot of applied analysis and criminology and other fields, and that's a shame. Um, in practice, when it gets ignored, what it means is that people have too much certainty about their results in general, right? It means that you're not taking account of all the sources of uncertainty that actually exist in your data. Um, and so it's kind of cheating to ignore measurement error and missing data. And I strongly encourage you to take it seriously. Um, we're going to kind of treat them as separate topics today and show both a Bayesian approach to dealing with measurement error and missing data, uh, which is um, in principle straightforward, but in practice a bit complex. Um, and then we're also going to show you the most common approach to dealing with missing data in both a frequentist uh, context that also can be used in a Bayesian context and there's multiple implications. Uh, so we'll cover both approaches today. Um, and without further ado, we'll dive in. This is a pet kind of um, passion of mine is, is appropriately thinking about measurement error and missing data. I think it's really important for us to think about what produces data and how certain we are about measurement. Okay, so uh, what is measurement error, right? Uh, so when we are randomly sampling a unit from a larger population, uh, we get a single value, right? So if I'm designing a survey of uh, people recently released from prison in New Jersey to evaluate recidivism, and I have a, a list of all those who were released, and I take a 5% sample of everyone who was released in that year, right? And then I look at their, um, let's say their, their income six months after release or something like that, right? Now I can report that, uh, but if I report that as, let's say I, I get an estimate of their monthly income is $800 or something like that, right? Um, which is nowhere near enough to live on in New Jersey. Um, and I report that as, $800 is the true number for how much people are earning six months after they're released from prison in New Jersey. I've just lied, right? Because it isn't. It's it's a result from a 10% sample or 5% sample or whatever percent sample it is of the population. Now, given that we know what percent of the population we've sampled, we can construct a standard error around that estimate, right? We can construct a window of uncertainty, right? We can say, how certain are we that this number is accurate? Uh, and in fact, what we, we don't actually know though that that's the center of the distribution around which we're gonna populate what's often called uh, a margin of error, right? So if you hear a polling result, well, okay, so we know that um, whatever presidential candidate is polling at 51 plus or minus three. Right Now they're assuming a sampling distribution for the parameter that they've just reported. They're assuming that well, so, so we, we've taken a 1% sample of voters in this state, um, and we know that that's going to induce a certain amount of error. And we're going to say plus or minus three to induce that error. But the problem with that is, so they might have the error calculation correct in terms of how wide the interval is, but centering that point, right? Do we know that the 1% sample you drew is actually at the middle of the sampling distribution for that population? We actually don't know that, right? Uh, that's a strong assumption to put that right at the middle. So the single value X that we draw from a sample, right, uh, differs by some unknown amount from the true population value of you, right? That's sampling error. We know this intuitively, but we don't often incorporate it into our analysis. Uh, so our observation is one of a lot of possible values that could have been observed, right? A potentially infinite number of values that could have been observed with a random sample of the population. And so treating that observation as the truth is unwise. And in effect, if we put this into a regression and don't adjust for the uncertainty we have about it, we are treating it as a population parameter. We're treating it as the truth about the population when we don't really know that. What we know is that this is one possible uh, observation that could have been drawn when we sampled the population, right? We need to think about the probability distribution that that sample comes from. The data generating process, right? We need to think seriously about that. So let's think about how we do this in practice. So let's go back to that divorce data. 
And notice that we get a standard error with the divorce rate, right? So we have a divorce number and a divorce standard error. These are derived from the American Community Survey. And so anytime you work with American Community Survey data, which is really, really common, uh, and I use it all the time, uh, it's the product that the census runs that gives us estimates of uh, what's going on in the population between the 10-year censuses, right? So um, the ACS is a 1% annual sample of the population, right? And so, uh, you know, every household in America has a 1 in 100 chance of being sampled by the ACS every year. I mean, it's stratified by place, so that's not exactly right. But uh, it's a 1% survey. Um, and so in any given year, Right. What, what we get is we get population estimates that are, um, you know, highly useful for understanding uh, dynamics and population between the census. Um, and each estimate you get from the ACS comes with the point estimate for divorce in Alabama, but it also comes with a standard error. Right. Or what's called in, in the ACS a margin of error, which is just a 90 percent interval bounds, which we can convert to a standard error pretty easily by. Um, dividing by 1.65, but um, that's neither here nor there. Um, we can convert those into a standard error. And so what that gives us is the variance that is expected in that, um, in that point estimate, right? Uh, and so it gives us kind of bounds on where we think the truth could be. Um, now, if you skim through criminology or demography or sociology or political science or economics or whatever journals, which is, you know, the ACS is incredibly common uh, to use in those places, the number of papers you're going to see that adjust for the measurement and precision in those estimates, I bet will be, if, if we were to review 100 papers, I would guess fewer than five took that measurement error seriously. But what that says, you know, when we do things like measure the poverty rate in a city, and we break it down by census tract or something like that, but we often use the ACS for such a task, um, we're actually going to have quite a lot of uncertainty about what those poverty rates are across places. Um, and so this approach is one that you could directly apply to the ACS. Um, I almost incorporated a direct example where we pulled data, but this lecture was already too long. Um, but, you know, if this is an interest, uh, a topic of interest to you, I'm happy to speak one-on-one -on -one about how you could kind of take what we're doing today go get raw American community survey data and apply it to it. Um, okay, so uh, we have a standard error on divorce rates. So, you know, if we were just to do our back of the envelope math here, we would say that divorce in Alabama uh, is centered at 12.7 uh, with a 95% interval that's plus or minus 0.8, right? So we would say that, you know, there's 1.6 Upper, so we would say 14.3 is probably the upper limit of divorce, and 12.7 minus one is like what 10.1, or I'm sorry, 11.1 is the lower limit, something like that, um, based on a just crude two time standard error calculation, right? But again, do we know that 12.7 is the center of that distribution? No, right? This was this was one sample that we drew. We we have an estimate for how much variance there is. We don't actually know where the center of that distribution is. Um, now, even just pretending that the center of distribution is there and putting a standard error around it is better than most people do, right? So you're already making progress if you're thinking in those terms. But we have the standard error. What can we do with it, right? Other than give us intervals around each point estimate, which is not bad, but it doesn't help us clean up our regression inferences. Okay, so here's what that uncertainty actually looks like. Right, so if we take those standard errors and we get make a 90% interval around them, right, um, you can see how uncertain we actually are about these divorce rates, right? So we get those point estimates. For Arkansas, we got like a, I don't know what that is, a 14, um, but you can see how wide that interval is on it. For all states, we can see pretty wide intervals with the exception of Texas is pretty narrow, New York is pretty narrow, New Jersey is pretty narrow. What do we think might be going on there? Bigger population. Yeah, so if it's a 1% sample and we are drawing 1% of the population in states with larger populations, that means we're surveying more people and we have more precision, right? So 
We get more precision when our sample size goes up. Remember that a standard error calculation has a square root of n in the denominator. So as sample size increases, standard errors shrink, right? Uh, so for those small states like Vermont, we've got a ton of uncertainty, right? For who are you? Alaska, wild uncertainty about where the true divorce rate is, right? But in some states, we're pretty sure where it exists. So how can we fold this into our model, right? Uh, if we're more, because remember, we're going to use divorce as an outcome in a regression model. And, you know, these high value states often have pretty wide intervals. These low value states often have pretty wide intervals. So, you know, the, these states that are going to pull our regression line most are states that we might not actually know where the true value is, right? And so we want to make sure we, we adjust for that. Now, in a Bayesian context, what we can do is we can just draw samples. Right? We can populate that uncertainty into our model and basically evaluate what values of the parameter we would get for all of those possible values of where the divorce rate could be. Right? We can simulate it. And that's pretty cool. Uh, just so we get a sense of the population effect. Right? This is the standard error of divorce plotted against population size. Right? And we can see this uh, you know, uh, 1 over square root n relationship in the uh, curve of a declining standard error for increasing population size, right? Uh, so it's a fixed percent of the population sample. It's not a fixed n sample. If it were a fixed n sample, we wouldn't see much of a relationship here, but it's a fixed percent. And so places with smaller populations don't have as many sampled households and they have larger error. This is also a reason why if you're looking at things like the ACS and you see someone looking at census tracts or at block groups or something like that, you should think really carefully about measurement error because sometimes you might only have one sampled household in that unit and you might be making an inference about a whole you know, tract with hundreds of households based on one sampled household. And there's obviously going to be a ton of noise in that relative to the truth. Um, so you, know, you need to really understand where these data are coming from and think about how we're going to adjust for error. Okay. So, uh, what does this mean in practice, right? So, for New Jersey, right, uh, we have a 6.1% uh, estimated divorce rate and a 0 0.46 estimated standard error. So, if we assume that New Jersey's true divorce rate is in fact 6.1, and that would be super, super duper lucky. Right, because that would mean we drew exactly the true population value from our 1% sample, which is basically guaranteed to not happen. But let's just make that assumption, right? Uh, then these are values that we could have obtained, right? If we were to repeat the sample, we could have obtained any of these values, right? I'm just going to draw 10 random numbers from a normal with mean 6.1 and standard deviation 0.46. So any of those values are as plausible as the 6.1 if 6.1 is the center of that distribution, which we don't know if 6.1 is the center of the distribution. Okay, so we cool with the basic setup here. We don't know where the center of the, the, the distribution is. We're gonna take it on face value that we do know the standard error of the distribution, or the standard deviation of the distribution. And we're also gonna assume it's normally distributed, right? That might not be a good assumption. Maybe we wanna, Think about another distribution like a student's T or something if we think we have fatter tails. Um, or if it's clumped up at zero, maybe we want to think about some kind of reshaped distribution there. But uh, we'll go with this for now. We could always standardize it and then, you know, look at adjustments there to, if we have sort of ceiling and floor stuff. Um, okay, no questions. We feel good about this. This, this is kind of a wonky idea, but. Um, you know, so we're thinking about our observations as emerging from a sampling distribution, right? And we want to recover some information about that sampling distribution of our observation, not of some, you know, parameter. Could we just um, center at basically like the mean of the United States? So if the mean population per, like, and I know that's kind of wildly because New York is obviously significantly larger than, say, Alaska in population size, but. Would that work as kind of a... Um, so you're kind of... Uh, so if we were to do like a grand mean centering across... It's, I mean, so it would center them, you know, further or closer to zero. I mean, it would okay. help with that problem of floor effects if we were worried about not wanting to predict a divorce rate below zero. Doing some kind of centering where we allow negative values does help there. 
and maybe makes the case for the normal a little easier. Um, that's the only context in which the transformations to allow for negative values where we have floors, right? Like zero is a floor on divorce um, and 100 right. is a floor on it as well because it's a percent. So doing some mm -hmm. kind of transformation to put it on a negative infinity to infinity scale would help with that. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, uh, I mean, it's a linear transformation, so it's not going to affect inference generally, right? Um, so yeah, you can do whatever transformation you want. It, you know, as long as you can get us back to a scale that people can understand, it doesn't really matter. I, yeah. I just wanted to clarify what you just said. You said that we're... Um, I just lost it in my notes. No. Okay. Oh, we're thinking about our observations as emerging from a standard error distribution. Is that the what sampling you're distribution. Okay. Uh, with a known standard error, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we want to imagine, like, so now because we we know that our our data are measured with error, right? Mm -hmm. Uh. We know that they're not perfect. These are not based on a census, right? And even the census has measurement error. But I mean, let's assume that the census is perfect. Then we can treat those as gold standard observations with no uncertainty, right? And sometimes we have that, but a lot of times we don't, right? A lot of times we have a sample of some bigger phenomenon of interest. And if that's the case, then we have error in our measurement and it's unknown, right? And sometimes we have information about how variable the sampling is, or we can do some power analysis or something like that to get some crude approximation of how variable that is. And then we can bake that in to how we think about where the data comes from. So we can kind of imagine what is the process that generated our data and then use information about that to try and recover information about how much error there is in this variable that we've got. Okay, cool. Other questions? Okay, so if the true divorce rate in New Jersey is 6.3, which again, we don't know, but that's what we observe. So or I'm sorry, 6.1. I'm just going to say 6.3 now because 6.3 is just as plausible under this distribution as 6.1, right? There's a 6.2, a 5.8, a 6.8, a 6.25. So why not? Let's center it at 6.3. This is the density of possible observations with the 1% ACS, right? This is what we could have observed, right? Now the peak and, and most of the mass is kind of clustered around these sixes, right? But more extreme values are certainly possible for us to have observed in that data, right? And if we treat any one of those as the true divorce rate, then we're kind of missing the fact that the true divorce rate uh, is actually kind of producing this, this, this sampling distribution. And this is actually what we're drawing our information from, yeah? So we want to recover this distribution. And in Bayes, it's really easy for us to kind of imagine a variable as not being a variable, but instead being a distribution, right? That's kind of how we've been thinking all along, um, is that variables and, and, and parameters, in fact, are best represented as probability distributions, both in a prior and a posterior, right? Okay, um, so this is the possible, you know, draws that we could see for the density of draws we could see for New Jersey if the truth were 6.3 with that 0 0.46 standard error, right? It's just a normal density. So we could see a 5.2, we could see a 7.2. Most of the time we're gonna see values between six and seven, you know, but there's some range. There's a lot of range in what we could see year to year. It's also why looking at a time series of one year data on the ACS is a fool's errand, right? Because each draw, is random from this distribution. So the trends are gonna bump all over the place, right? If we have enough data, maybe we can pick up some signal here, but there's a lot of variability year to year that's just a function of measurement error. And so trying to pick up the 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013 divorce rate, uh, we may uh, you know, have some trouble picking up a signal there because there's so much noise from the sampling error. And the census typically discourages people from trying to build out time series using the ACS. Right. Even though I've done it in papers, it's generally not a good idea. Uh, you know, these are the things that you don't, uh, this was not a formal part of my training, um, but I think it's a really important piece for us to think about. Um, okay. So let's treat the truth as a parameter 
right? So the truth here is unknown, but we have an observation and we have a standard error. So we know that we have a standard error and we have an observation that, that, it, that it, uh, we, we have an observation that was a draw from the distribution that is centered with the truth. And the truth here is gonna be the mean of the true sampling distribution, the center of that true sampling distribution, right? Whatever the true divorce rate is in New Jersey, we have some sampling distribution around that driven by the size of the sample we're gonna draw, right? And so the observations we're gonna get from that 1% sample, we're gonna assume have a normal centered around the true value, but we don't know what the true value is. Um, so we don't observe D true, but we can estimate a posterior for it, right? So we can put it into our model and get a posterior density of where that truth parameter actually is for each state in the country, right? So we can get 50 posteriors for divorce rate out of our model relatively easily. All right, so we're going to add a second likelihood into our model. This gets a little funky, but it, 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 it uh, you know, the, the approach shouldn't look too different from what we saw with the multi-level model, right? So now we're going to have a distribution for our observes that's normal, centered on the truth with the standard error that we obtain from the data, right? So we're not going to allow any variability on that standard error. We're just going to say that standard error is right. Uh, but we don't know the center of this distribution. And we're going to allow that parameterized true distribution then to go into our normal likelihood. So first, we're going to draw uh, a, a sample, right, uh, where we're going to put, uh, you know, the typical priors here. Um, I think I'm supposed to have an extra prior here that I don't. Um, apologies that I may, I, I think I'm, yeah. No, we're good. Um, okay, so so the truth is going to be normally distributed mu sigma, just as before, right? But then we're going to have uh, the extra step here where we're going to allow the observations to generate parameter values for the truth. And what we're going to get is we're going to get um, shrinkage, right, as our imputations kind of of the observation based on the known standard error learn from uh, what. Uh, from our linear predictor, right? So our linear predictor says that divorce rates are a function of the age at first marriage and the marriage rate, right? So in effect, we're gonna draw our regression line and say that the truth should be inflected. Yeah, the standard error is obtained from the observation. Uh, so the standard error is just given in this context, right? Uh, sometimes we may not have a given standard error and that's gonna make your life more difficult, but it's not gonna make it impossible. Um, Okay, so we get kind of information going back and forth between our regression model and the standard error and observed data, right? So now we're actually going to use our regression model to improve our estimate of where the center of that distribution for divorce is, right? We're going to draw the regression line, and then those measurement at the center of those distributions is going to get nudged a little bit toward that regression line, depending on how much information we've got. This sounds a little crazy. It's a little crazy. Let's kind of see how it plays out. All right, so here's how we set this model up with ULAM. Okay, we just package our data as before. We need to send an N parameter now as well to initialize this new vector of imputed values for the truth, right, that adjust for measurement error. We're going to allow the observed to be a function of the truth. And then we're going to set up 50 new parameters for the truth, right, that have this mu sigma. And the mu sigma, I, I'm sorry, the, the truth is going to follow this regression line, right? Um, so this, this all looks a little crazy. That's fine. But it, really, the only addition here is uh, putting this here instead of d obs here and then putting a distribution on d obs. That's all we've changed. Uh, and just to compare, we're going to estimate a model with no measurement error, right? Uh, so here we can kind of compare the difference in the model specification. We have this dobs is d norm with true and se, right? We're not going to have that over here. We're just going to have dobs as distributed mu sigma. We're going to treat those observed values as the truth, as opposed to treating them as this, right? In our measurement error model, we're going to treat each observation as this as being measured with a lot of noise. And that measurement is going to influence 
our posterior, but it's not going to be treated as if it's known with certainty. Okay, so here I'm going to walk you through the results of these models real quick. So that's the regression line from the no error model, right? By so that's age at first marriage on the X and the posterior mu on the Y. Here's our uh, posterior estimates for mu in the no error model, or in the error model, right? In the model where we've uh, accounted for measurement error. And here's the observed values, right? So the posterior means are clustered around those regression lines, but the observes are often quite far away from those regression lines. And so what's happened here is that the model has allowed us to pull the posterior means for each observation for divorce rates much closer into the regression line for places where we've got a lot of measurement error. And those tend to be the extreme values, right? When we go back to this plot, we kind of noted that those places that were, so the, the average would be about here, but those places farther away from the average often tended to have higher error, right? And so those are getting pulled in quite a lot. We're getting shrinkage here because we have uncertainty about where the true measurement is. And so we're allowing the model to pull things in, to regularize them toward the mean a bit. And so for those of us who might be worried about outliers measured with a lot of imprecision, this is a great way to deal with it, right? We have information about the imprecision. So let's effectively downweight the influence of those measures on our model, right? This is similar to a weighted regression, but instead we're going to allow the width, the uncertainty in that uh, density for where that measure is, right? So instead of treating it as a single observation, now we're treating it as this density. And the wider that density is, the less influence it's going to have on our model, right? Because we have more uncertainty about where the truth is, and it's going to pull the line in all kinds of different places. And that's going to effectively kind of lose out in terms of influence to places that are measured with more certainty. So it effectively downweights those places that are measured with more uncertainty. Sometimes you'll see people weight regressions by the, you know, inverse log of the population or something like that. And this is, you know, going to give us a similar kind of effect, but I think it's more principled because it's actually adjusting directly for measurement uncertainty. Okay. And then this, the red dots are those uh, that come from the model without measurement error, right? And the key difference between the model without measurement error and the model with measurement error, we should see slightly uh, wider uncertainty intervals in the model with measurement error. But you can see in this case, it looks like there's a little bit of bias, right? That that regression line that we can imagine cutting through those red dots looks a bit different than the regression line that we've estimated here that cuts through the black dots, right? It's a little bit shallower. Um, and we see slightly less shrinkage in that model as well. The only shrinkage happening in the no error model is due to the priors. Okay, so this is the magnitude of shrinkage that we see. This is the posterior mean minus the observed value. And we can see that as the standard error increases, kind of going left to right, we see more spread in the error in terms of the observed minus, or the mu, of mu minus the observed, right? We, we see a bit more spread in our standard errors as we go out. You know, there's still a bit of spread here for relatively low standard errors. But um, typically, as, as the error increases, we should see, as the error in measurement increases, we should see uh, more error in terms of the residual from the regression. Um, yeah, you may see these referred to as error in measurement models sometimes as well. That's kind of a generic term that you'll see uh, used in the applied statistics literature is an error in measurement model. And here's the posterior for each observation of D, right? So we actually now get samples for each value of D, right? Because the truth is now a parameter in our model, right? The true value of divorce, we get 50 of them, and those are parameters in the model. So we can sample the posterior for each of those now. And here's what they look like. So for Arkansas, 
right, which had a very extreme value. You can see that the posterior got pulled in. For main, which was also measured with a lot of uncertainty, our posterior now no longer includes the observation. And that might generate some concern for us and make us rethink some parts of the model. Maybe we have some missing, some, some omitted variables that can help us improve the amputation there. Um, but you can see that those extreme values from small population states are getting pulled in a lot toward the mean, right? Because we effectively don't have a lot of information about where the truth is for those cases. And remember, our model doesn't think that there's any reason that that one sample from this distribution should actually be the center of it, right? Our model wants to regularize things and pull them in. So there's only two states where the interval doesn't include the mean, and it's Idaho and Maine. And those states are exceptional for other reasons, right? Um, you know, we talked about high levels of uh, Mormons in Idaho and potentially the, the horribly long winters increases divorce rates in Maine and Alaska in ways that we might need to adjust for like the length of the summer season or something um, as people are confined with their loved ones for inordinate periods of time. I don't know, maybe the quarantine is a good, uh, you know, uh, comparison group there for divorce rates and confinement, but uh, people have been speculating as such. Um, but we shall see soon, I suppose. Um, okay, anyway, uh, this is what the posterior, this is what our model's doing, right? In general, it's pulling things in toward the mean based on the regression line that includes age at, median age at marriage and overall marriage rate. Now, we know that that's not the perfect regression model, so these may not perfectly pull things toward the truth. Right? But it's going to regularize things toward the regression line, whatever that regression line is. Questions about this? But this is pretty cool, right? We've populated that uncertainty we had in the measurement of divorce now into our model, right? It's folded in and it's now an additional source of uncertainty in the model itself. And this is great. Um, this is the sort of thing we should be doing more of. Bayes gives us a sort of really reasonable approach to do this. In a frequentist context, uh, what we would have to do is something akin to multiple imputation, where we would need to simulate out potential new draws of the divorce rate and then run a model over those many times and then average the results. I'll show you how to do that later. But this is a much more principled way to deal with measurement errors, just to directly fold that uncertainty into our model and to draw it. Okay, but Ulam is kind of a pain in the butt, right? And it's, it's, it's a nice piece of software, but it's maybe not how we're gonna be working all the time. So here's a way to do it with BRM, right? So uh, we can, BRM can directly sample missing and uh, measurement error variables uh, as part of the regression process, right? So we know that we can set up the distribution of observed as a function of a plus n using the formulas as we kind of covered in lab last time, right? Now to specify that we have a, an outcome measured with error, we put on the left-hand side, this is our outcome here. We put a pipe and we put this mi function, which stands for imputation, multiple imputation, with the standard error in parentheses. And now what it's gonna do is it's gonna treat the observed as being measured with error with the standard error defined there. And it's gonna have the same linear predictor, that A plus M. This is gonna do the same thing as what Ulam did, right? This is gonna do the same thing as this. But I find this far easier to write. Right, the priors here are the same priors as before, but now our formula for measurement error in the outcome is just this. Right, we use the MI function and then it's gonna generate all the code we need to run that model for us. Um, okay, so here is the posterior from BRMS for each value of D, the uh, divorce rates, and those are really similar to what we got out of Ulam. Right, the model specifications are going to look slightly different because it's a different software, but you can see Idaho and Maine are still the only states where we didn't really see that um, lining up exactly uh, the observed within the interval and the posterior. And then in general, we get that pull toward the mean for these intervals away from the extreme value. Yeah. 
these are performing really similarly. When you're switching to new software, it's always a good idea to kind of gut check the results against what you know work. Um, okay, so this is a cool process. Now, um, so sorry, uh, questions about the BRM setup, the BRMS setup? This is something that if you have a fixed standard error uh, that, that you know, you should do, right? And this is pretty easy to handle. So things like the ACS, other survey samples where we can calculate a standard error for our measurements, we should be thinking about how to fold that into our analysis. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a good it's a good habit to get into to kind of um, you know take the data generating process really seriously as a source of uncertainty in your analysis. Okay, cool. Sometimes we don't know standard errors and that can make life a little more complex. Uh, and, and we still might have measurement error there. Uh, there are approaches to deal with that, but they're a little more complicated than what I have talked about today. But you should think about error. You should definitely think about error. Okay, uh, cool. So what if we have measurement error on both outcomes and predictors, which we do here, right? So both the marriage and divorce rates are measured from the American Community Survey, and we've got some uncertainty about both of them, right? Marriage rates have a standard error. Divorce rates have a standard error. And notice that marriage is going to be measured with more uncertainty than divorce because divorce is a subset of marriage, right? Uh, so it's a smaller number. We're going to have less variability in a smaller number than we are in a bigger number, right? Um, so for Alabama, we've got a 1.27 standard error uh, on marriage and a 0 0.79 standard error on divorce. Okay, so we want to fold our uncertainty in divorce in, as we've done, but we also want to fold our uncertainty about marriage in, right? So how do we do that? So if we assume that the observed marriage and divorce rates are the true value, the sampling distribution for each state, before we could kind of, you know, look at it uh as uh just a simple density right with a with a width but now we have a two-dimensional sampling distribution we have a multivariate sampling distribution where both marriage and divorce have uncertainty on them so what does that look like we can get this funky thing that catherine described as looking like ringworm um but we can <laughs> effectively think about right this as being the kind of topographical density of what the sampling distribution, the joint sampling distribution for divorce and marriage looks like if we centered it where it's centered in the observed, right? So in this case, we have marriage on the X and divorce on the Y. So for Alaska, our uncertainty in marriage is represented by width on the X and our uncertainty in divorce is illustrated by density on the Y. So there's a lot of places. If we're interested in understanding the relationship between marriage and divorce, Right in Alaska, it could be a lot of different places. That cloud is big. But if we look, for example, at California, right, we've got a really narrow zone in which the sampled marriage and divorce rates could be. So this is just kind of helping us to kind of visualize what these sampling distributions look like in uh, two dimensions, right? But uh, it's a little funky plot, but I, I think it's helpful just to think about how much uncertainty we do have about what marriage and divorce rates are in South Dakota, for example, right? We have no clue. We have no clue where those are. Um, and so we want to populate that uncertainty into the model. I mean, I suspect we think they're below 25, right? But that's about it um, in terms of marriage rates. They could be anywhere between 10 and 25. We just don't know um, because the population is so small, right? Okay, so we can effectively just add in one more line into our likelihood, right? That was the prior, no, no, we're good, never mind. Uh, we, can, we can incorporate one more line into our, our model where we put a likelihood on the marriage rate, right? Where we say the marriage rate is a normal variable with some unknown true uh, that we're gonna estimate from the model and the data, right? And then we put a prior on that true, true value. And remember, these are mean-centered. So zero is going to be, uh, the national mean center, as Anthony suggested earlier, right? Just to help with computation and setting priors. Um, so just as we did with divorce, 
right, where we're going to sample it based on this assumed relationship, we're now going to do the same thing with marriage, right? Uh, we're not putting a linear function on marriage here. We're just kind of letting it be a function of the observed, the standard error, and then our prior. But we could put another linear function in there to say that, okay, this is how marriage works. And uh, we're, instead of saying m obs is just, and then we could say m true has a linear function just like uh, d true does. We could put a second linear function in there if we wanted mar you know, marriage rate to be a function at age at first marriage and whether you're in the South and whether there's a lot of Mormons there, right? Or something like that. I keep picking on the Mormons. I'm sorry. I will stop. Um, they get married early and they don't divorce much. This is, this, is, this is demographically true. Anyway, here's how we estimate the model with Ulam, right? And that's fine. Here's how we estimate it with BRM. It's a little easier, so I'm just going to focus on that. Right. Remember last time we put this M I D S E on the left hand side, and that's specific to the predictor. If it's measurement error in outcome, we use the M E function. For some reason, the measurement error function doesn't work on outcomes. It only works on predictors. We can use the M I or the multiple imputation function for outcomes. Um, BRM is still new software developing. So um, I found something from the package author that explained how to set this up. But um, we can, on the, on the right-hand side of the model, on the predictors, we use ME, which stands for measurement error, and we put the observed value, the vector of observed values there, and then the standard error as the second argument, right? And that's going to draw samples of M from the, pos, uh, from, from, from the uh, HMC process, and we're going to get a posterior distribution uh, for marriage rates, just as we did with divorce rates. Questions about this setup? Again, this is almost too easy, right? This is, this is actually trivially easy to do if we have a fixed standard error. There's no reason to not just sample from the distribution of possible values for marriage in our model like this. It's very easy to do. This is a bit trickier to set up, but the book does walk us through how to do it pretty well. And the code that this is gonna generate for Stan and the code that this is gonna generate for Stan are very similar. So it's going to run very similar models through Stan, right? Effectively, what BRM is, it's doing the same thing Ulam is, where it's translating one way of writing a model into Stan for us and then running that model. Which is to say, if you really like this approach and you want to go further, then learning Stan is not a bad next step, although it is a steep hill. I think for most of us, learning BRMS is the right next step because it's a kind of high-level interface that still gives us a lot of the benefits we get out of HMC and Stan. Okay, cool. So measurement error to summarize, unless there are questions about measurement error. Are we good? Okay, so data are just about always measured with error, right? Uh, and sometimes we know the magnitude of the error. And when we do, that's great. We should incorporate it into our model. And the key feature here is that these Bayesian models are generative, meaning we can simulate new data just as we're estimating our parameters, right? There's no problem with using our Bayesian model as a data generating process itself based on what we learn from the likelihood when it combines with the priors and based on what we already know about the distribution of these values. So we should take advantage of the fact that Bayesian models can just sample and simulate like this and bake it into our estimation process. It's great. This is one of the key benefits of Bayesian inference is we can fold this kind of uh, imputation procedure just directly into our model instead of making it a separate step. Um, now, correlated errors across multiple measures can induce pretty significant bias that you want to think through. Um, there are some examples using DAGs about what this looks like on page 498 in the book. So I do encourage you to think about if we have, you know, for example, error on marriage and divorce and those errors are correlated with each other um, we want to think through how that might emerge and we might want to introduce a correlation structure into our imputation right such that if we think that you know um, some third value like low population means that we get more negative divorce rates and more negative uh, marriage rates and those the errors we get from measurement are going to be correlated there, then we, we can have problems that we want to think through. But that's um, a, a, a kind of high level problem that we can uh, kind of return to if you're working through a problem that where you think might be the case. 
For examples like the ACS, it's not something we need to worry too much about because the census thinks really hard about constructing samples and making sure that those kinds of errors don't occur. Um, okay. Despite nonsense with most federal research agencies, the census is pretty darn solid. Um, okay. So, missing. I, I a, yeah. Quick question Is there ever a time when the standard error, and this might get to missing data a little bit too, but just it's so large that even Im imputing this into the model that like it's just going to give you wildly incorrect results. <laughs> well, incorrect how? I mean, it's no more incorrect than using that point estimate you got, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, there are cases where the, the interval, um, like a 90% interval for a point mm -hmm. on a population, let's say I was looking at, and I often do look at like, the American Indian child population in a city below the age of five, right? Uh, let's say a city in, you know, I don't know, Illinois. Um, there might be in the population like 15 of them. And the probability that a household with, you know, more than one household with a kid that fits that description uh, in that city was sampled is basically zero, right? So there might be one household that was sampled there. Um, and that interval will include zero, right? Um, so yeah, no, those, those intervals can be quite wide. Um, but our model doesn't have a problem with that, right? Remember that, um, if we have a super wide interval as we do in Alaska or South Dakota, effectively that uncertainty, is just going to get populated out into the model. And those observations are going to have less weight. Okay. Um, because they are spread out, right? And so they're, they're not going to pull the regression line in any particular direction because we have a lot of uncertainty about where that observation is. So no, don't, so yeah, I mean, it, so I wouldn't necessarily trust the point estimate there, right? If I see a standard error that's huge, basically if I see a standard error that is larger than the point estimate, then like, yeah, that point estimate is unreliable. Uh, okay. But it doesn't mean that there's not information there, mm -hmm. right? It just means that we need to think about it as a distribution and not as a point estimate. Like, we still know that the population, if, if we're in, a, in that context, we know the population is small, right? And that's information. And we know that, you know, it has some range of possible values, and that's still useful. The lesson for today is generally, like, use the information you've got, right? And use it fully. Uh, don't throw anything away. Unless it is actually garbage, right? Where it, there's some kind of non-random error to it where like someone lied right <laughs> um or someone destroyed a form because they were scared of what it said right there are sources of measurement error and missing data that are uh systematic right like that and those are causes for concern that statistics can't save you uh, from right those are things where you just need better data but if the error is random like from sampling we can totally deal with it If, for example, with police killings, the error is non-random because agencies have a disincentive to report when they kill people, then we have a bigger problem, right? Okay. Um, cool. Any other questions on measurement error models? Okay, why don't we take um, three minutes and then we're going to move on to missing data. Okay, we'll come back. It's 10.50 my time. 10.53, we will reconvene. I'm happy to take questions in the break. Can you all hear my kids playing music in the background? No? You can? Okay. <laughs> They're like, we got those. Only in bursts. Okay. We got You're fine. A box of like a little like desk bells that you would like ding at a doctor's office. They're all different tones, so they just love slapping these bells all over the place. They're having fun. They, they are better than the alternative. All right, so we are gonna get started again, and we're gonna move on to missing data now. Missing data is a special case of extreme measurement error, right? Uh, so 
with measurement error, we have a draw from some possible sampling distribution, and we have some idea about the width of that sampling distribution. Uh, with missing data, we don't know anything. It's just missing, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have any information about where that value could live, right? We have the whole rest of the data, and we have some model that tells us about how other variables in the data are related to our outcome, right? Uh, so we can use those to help us infer the location of the missing data. Sometimes variables are missing a value. R calls these NA. We've seen NA a lot. There's a lot of reasons that a value could be missing from the data. It could be that, you know, the data were incriminating and were destroyed, uh, in which case we might be out of luck. But a lot of times it's because, um, you know, they couldn't find a survey respondent for that wave or they didn't respond in time or they skipped that question on the survey for some reason, right? Uh, lots of Lots of reasons that a value could be missing. And I need you to think hard about why your data is missing, right? And you're never going to be able to know with certainty why your data is missing, but you can come up with a list of possible reasons why some piece of information might be gone. And that's really critical for you to get your head inside the data generating process and think about what's going on here. Why might, for example, it's known that people with extremely low and extremely high incomes are less likely to report their income when they're asked about it, right? Because there's a social desirability bias that's against both being extremely poor and being extremely rich, right? So you need to think about what might be going on. Why might people not want to answer that question when they're asked it? Now, software is typically going to delete missing values. And so any row with a missing value that has a variable that's going into your model. I think they're talking about boba tea out there. We got like a homemade boba tea kit for Dorothy's birthday. She's really into it right now. Um, but typically what software is gonna do is it's just gonna remove any rows that has a variable that's going into our model, right? So let's say that we're modeling divorce rates uh, and we have a missing divorce rate for that row, but we do have the marriage rate and we do have the median age of first marriage. If that divorce rate's missing, R is just gonna throw that line out, despite the fact that we've got perfectly good information on two predictors in there, right? Uh, this is called list-wise deletion or complete case analysis. And it is the default for most software packages to just throw out NAs. In the best case, this discards good information, right? Best case scenario is you're throwing information away. Worst case scenario, you're biasing your inference, right? Uh, so and uh, what I'm advising is that you virtually never do list-wise deletion. There are some cases where it's defensible, but most of the time when you list-wise delete your data or you do complete case analysis, you're leaving information on the table, right? You're leaving good information on the table. And in some context, you're actually gonna get inferences that are meaningfully different from what you would have gotten if you had the full data, right? Uh, so avoid discarding data whenever possible, right? Don't throw information away. I think I've probably told you all this about a thousand times by now throughout the semester, but don't throw information away. Um, sometimes we can use common sense to replace missing, right? So if we have panel data, that is kind of data that's measured across the same individuals or units over time, right? Like, let's say I have uh, my favorite Otaga County, Alabama, and in one year, um, the value for state was missing on Otaga County, well, I know it's in Alabama, right? So I don't need to use any random procedure to impute that. I can just say that county's in Alabama. It didn't switch states and put it there, right? We might have, for a more re realistic example, might be that we have um, something like the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, the NLSY, and we might have like a date of birth recorded in the first wave, uh, or an approximate age reported in the first wave, and for some reason they didn't answer what their age was in the second wave, right? But we know what date it was administered on. So with the date of the first survey and an age on the first survey and the date of the second survey and an age on, and a missing age on the second survey, we can just put that value in, right? And we can write code to sniff out those, those kind of places and put values in. Um, so when we have uh, a kind of, this is a deterministic imputation, right? When we have some external source of information that tells us what that value is with certainty, 
we could just go ahead and put it in. But you need to be sure that you have certainty about where that value is, right? Uh, don't do this if it's like what their income was last year and what their and then their income this year is missing from the data, right? We don't know. We should not impute their in income for this year that's missing based on last year's income that's present because a lot of things could have happened, right? And we're going to overstate how certain we are. We don't. One of the key things I want us to avoid when thinking about measurement error or missing data is to be honest about our uncertainty. That's kind of the principle that's motivating this is is to allow the uncertainty we have about the data to be reflected in our models, right? And to be, to provide intervals that are as wide as they actually should be, right? And that can be an impulse that's hard to fight. And it's one reason why it's not often addressed uh, in the literature, if we're being cynical about it, is because not adequately addressing for uncertainty often means narrower uh, standard errors. It means narrower intervals, which means higher likelihood of significant results in a frequentist context, right? So this is a way to kind of inflate p-values if we're thinking in terms of p-values is to not deal with measurement error seriously. Um, but I don't want us to do that. I want us to take it seriously. Okay, um, avoid imputing data with a single value when we have any uncertainty about it, right? So like with income, right? Do not take the mean value of someone's income and just stick that in a missing. Right? Because what that's doing is, in effect, saying, I know with certainty where this value is. right? Uh, and it's going to not only reduce the variability within that individual's income, because it's almost certainly not the average of what it was the last few years. right? Um, it, it's going to kind of induce more of a line than should be there, and it's going to shrink those standard errors. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely going to artificially narrow your posterior intervals for that, for that measure. So don't do that. Um, that's often called like a hot deck imputation or a mean imputation. Don't do that, right? Do not simply replace one value with another uh, if you have any uncertainty at all about what that value is. If you know it with certainty, right, then go, feel free. If it's a state or an age, something that can be determined from some other piece of information with certainty, go for it. If it has any uncertainty at all in it, do not do that. We're going to use imputation models, right? Effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, this value is missing. We don't know where it is, but we can populate uncertainty around it based on some assumptions and based on what we know about the rest of the data, right? So if it is a multi-level model where we knew where this person was in time one, but we don't know where they are in time two, we can use random intercepts and slopes to think about possible trajectories of where that person could have been and then populate uncertainty around that. Uh, but what we want to do, so we, we can use a kind of principled approach to think about reasonable places where that value could have been, and then effectively generate distributions for that value that we're going to fold into our model as another source of uncertainty. What we're not doing is recovering the truth, right? What we're not doing is like producing a value that is the truth of the missing data. What we're doing is we're producing a distribution of values where that data is likely to have been, right? Because um, we can do that. We can't recover missing information. So you should always try and recover missing information any way you can, but if you just can't do it, the best approach is to treat it as a source of uncertainty in your model, right? Uh, and imputation procedures are a great way to do that. We already did one imputation procedure with the measurement error. We created effectively intervals around which those values that were measured with error, which is sort of partially missing, right? We created intervals around which those could have existed. Sorry. What did I want? I wanted that, right? We created intervals within which those values could have been observed. But in this case, we did have a piece of information. But what we're doing now is just an extension of this process. We're going to create intervals within which those missing values could have been. And then those possible values get folded into our model, right? And so what's this going to do? It's going to widen our uncertainty in general. Right, because we have an extra source of uncertainty in the model, but it's also going to lead, on average, to more accurate inferences, right, than just deleting those cases, particularly in cases where anything is correlated with the probability of missing this, which it almost always is. Okay, so that all was a lot. Let's work through some examples. Uh, so uh, first, I want to introduce some horrible names for the way this gets talked about in the literature, but you will see these, so I want you to be familiar with them. Um, we have a, different, a few different ways of thinking about why data could be missing. Um, these are kind of derived from um, 
uh, Rubin's work on missing data in the 70s and 80s, um, and this typology has just kind of been around since then. Um, but um, we have kind of three general types. We have missing completely at random, missing at random, and missing not at random. And those are bad names that don't really reflect what's going on. But missing completely at random means there's no correlation between any variable and the probability of missing it. Meaning every observation in the data has equal probability of being missing. Right? It's just completely random across the data set. Some values are missing. It's not correlated with anything. Um, every you know, row in a vector has an equal and fixed probability of being missing. Yeah? That's missing completely at random. Nothing determines it, it just happens sometimes. Missing completely at random. Now missing at random, which is the one that's really horribly named, um, means each observation's probability of being missing is conditional on some set of measured values. Meaning it's not random, right? It's not truly random, it's, it's, it's conditionally random. Meaning that some values are more likely to be missing than others, but we have variables in the data that can tell us which measures those are. Right, and which values are more likely to be missing than others because it's conditional on observables. Right? The missingness is conditional on things we can observe. And then we have missing not at random, where each observation's probability of being missing is conditional on something that we don't observe. Right? So if some, or it's correlated with the outcome itself. Right? Um, so in those contexts, there's some factor that we don't measure or can't measure that is determining missingness. In those cases, it's really hard to get valid inference. In these two cases, we can use imputation procedures to recover valid inference most of the time. In this context, sometimes we can, but a lot of times we can't. And the problem here is we, we can't test these assumptions generally. We can use simulations to think through them, but these are untestable. So we kind of have to make an assumption about what the missing data process is for our data, and that is an assumption that we need to be clear about. Right? And we can defend it. We can say, I think that I have enough data to, you know, um, this is why I think some measures are missing and not others, and I have a variable that should be correlated with the missingness that's going to go into my imputation model. Uh, but if you think you have a, uh, some other factor that's outside of your data system that you can't measure, uh, you may have trouble using imputation procedures. Okay, so let's work through some examples of what these looks like. I know this terminology is a bit much, but it, it should become clearer with these examples. So. This dog did actually eat my homework once. I was a college senior at the University of Texas, and I had a history class, and he ate my book. He, he was a puppy. He ate the book. I couldn't do the reading. Um, he, he's, 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 he's a good dog, though. Um, so why do dogs make homework go missing? This is kind of the, the, the problem we're going to think through. So, so homework has some value right? that's correlated with how much I studied. Okay, so however much I studied predicts my homework grade. And we're going to say homework grades can take on a value between 0 and 10, right? Where 10 is perfect, 0 is garbage. Um, and how much I studied predicts how well I do on my homework. But sometimes dogs eat homework, right? And so what the teacher sees is the true homework after conditioning on whether or not the dog ate it, right? And what we want to recover is the true homework grade. And we observe how much the person studied, right? So we have, oh, I'm sorry, this is bad LaTeX. We have, so we have H um, and we have H obs. H obs is the observed value for homework where some of the values are missing. H is the true value for homework, the true grade for homework, right? And we have how much you studied. So we know the truth because we're going to simulate it. And then we're going to randomly make some of them missing and we're going to see what it does. This is our DAG for that system, right? So studying affects your homework grade, right? The true homework grade. Your homework grade affects the observed homework grade, but sometimes dogs get in the way and eat the homework, which also affects the observed homework by making it missing, right? Now, this is a missing completely at random setup. Nothing is influencing the dog, right? The dog just sometimes decides to eat the homework. No one knows why. It has nothing to do with anything in the homework itself. It just happens, right? So, questions? Yes. Go ahead. Um, just to kind of play on this example to see if I can understand what we're getting at. 
an example of somewhere where the dog wouldn't be random is, let's say I ate peanut butter while doing the homework and it affected whether or not it's going to eat the, dog, uh, the, the book. Correct. Okay. Correct. Then the peanut butter is a omitted variable in this case that predicts whether the dog will eat it. By conditioning on peanut butter, then we can accurately measure missingness. We're going to get to that in a second. It won't be peanut butter, but we have an example that looks like that. Um, okay. So dogs strike at random. So let's simulate this, right? Uh, simulation is a really good way for us to get our heads around this because we can control what's missing and what's not, right? Uh, okay, so we have 100 homework assignments. This is our study vector. So it's just going to be a, a normal with a 0, 1. And we're going to get, you know, how, how much time you spent studying is going to be normally distributed with a mean of 0, right? And so negative values mean less studying. Positive values mean more studying. Our homework score is 100 draws with a count of 10, meaning that it could be as high as 10 and as low as 0, where the probability of uh, it being effectively a count of 1, right? The probability of you having a higher score is an inverse logit for your study time, right? So study time is a linear predictor on your probability of getting a higher score. The more you study, the better you're going to do on your homework. That's what our model says. And then the dog shows up, and we're going to give it a 0 0.2 probability of eating homework. So 20% of the time when you do your homework, the dog eats it, right? Uh, doesn't, it's not determined by anything. It's a fixed probability. So we're going to get a vector of 100 values that are either 0 or 1, right? And when it's a 1, the dog ate it. When it's a 0, the dog did not. We're going to make h obs equal to h, but then make it any time that the dog is equal to 1, we're going to zero that out as a missing, right? It's going to turn into missing when on the position of the dog vector, we have a one for each position on the observed, right? And so then we get 22 missing values, the maximum, this is our homework vector of observes, right? So out of our 100, 22 of them became missing because of dogs. Are we cool on this setup for the simulation? Any questions about what we're doing here or how I set this up? You don't really need to under, like, be able to replicate this code, but I want you to understand the principles of what's going on here. We're good? Okay. So, how does the missingness affect inference, right? So let's do listwise deletion and see. Okay, remember, listwise deletion is the default. So we don't have to tell R anything. We just need to run a regression on H obs, right? Because H obs has 22 missing values. So we're going to get a regression that's effectively going to withhold those 22. So we're going to get 78 cases here. Uh, so I'm going to set up a data frame. I'm using Broom just to show you the output. Uh, don't worry too much about that. So I'm fine. fine. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so this is where it says, you know, warning, so many values have been omitted. Yes. If you okay. actually get this code, it will say warning, 22 values were discarded or omitted, right? Uh, R is just telling you, hey, just so you know, you thought you were getting 100 values in, you're not, because there's missing, and you haven't told me what to do with them. I'm going to just remove them for now, beforehand, with a filter, but I could send them in, and it would remove them. Um, okay, so here's what we get, right? We get a typical regression output. I'm just using BRM. I didn't specify priors here. I'm just going to let it use default priors. That's fine for me in this case, because I'm not real worried about the specification. But remember, when we're using software, typically we do want to specify our priors. Um, OK. So nothing too special here yet, right? We see a positive relationship between studying and test scores, or homework scores, which we should see. Um, this is with the complete data, right? So I just use H here instead of H obs. Remember, I didn't let the dogs eat anything in this context because we observed the truth here because I simulated it. So let's think about what's going on. Um, so our parameter values, 5.01 on the intercept, 5.05 .05 on the intercept are indistinguishable. 2.3 on the slope, 2.3 on the slope, indistinguishable, right? Our sigma is a little lower here, 1.41, 1.48, right? But in this case, because the likelihood that any value was pulled out is just totally at random in the population. On average, it's not going to bias our inference to delete the cases, right? Because there's nothing correlated with the test score or the study time that's predicting whether or not the dog ate it. It's just pulled out at random. 
So the only thing that's going to happen with listwise deletion here is our standard error estimates are going to be a bit too low, right? So the, the variability we see in the population is going to be lower in the true value where we help where we have more information, right? Um, and potentially we could see some differences on the interval for our S parameter. Not much here. So in a case where, we're, where the data is missing completely at random and we have a lot of data, right? In this case, we have 100 and that's not too bad with two variables. We actually aren't going to suffer too much with listwise deletion, right? Um, at best, all it's going to do is make uh, our, interval, our interval is a little fatter because we have a lower n, right? So missing completely at random does not bias your inferences if you do listwise deletion. Now, we don't know whether our data are missing completely at random unless we're in a simulation, right? Uh, so it's still not a great idea to just delete them. The only case in which it doesn't hurt you is in the case where the data are truly just uh, you know, every row has some chance of being missing and it's not correlated with anything in the data. Then it doesn't hurt you to delete them. Too bad, other than the fact that you're losing power. Right? So it's still a good idea to go ahead and go through a missing data procedure just to keep your number of observations in case. Because, you know, in this case, we did discard perfectly good information on study time. Right? Okay. Questions on that? Missing completely at random, no impact really on bi no bias induced by listwise deletion in this case. So it, it's okay to um, <clears throat> it's not necessarily that listwise deletion is bad as long as it's I don't know I'm just thinking back to like um, uh, my master's thesis the for example I was looking at supervision conditions in a pretrial setting and um, there there were out of the data set, there were like 200 people who had no supervision because they were like low level offenses. So it, I don't know, I, I kind of utilized listwise deletion, but now I'm just like thinking back to that, but it kind of went back to the research questions, I guess. Is... Well, think about why it was missing, right? So if they weren't, if your questions were about community supervision and these people didn't have community supervision, then they weren't missing, they were out of sample, right? right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, so this just kind of, you got to think about what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. This all just folds. So it's in that case, you actually do know with certainty that these people had no community supervision. Right. And so right. any of those measures uh, are meaningless for that group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that case, that was the correct approach. Right. Right. Um, but I mean, I think the, the the challenge that I want to pose to you all is to think really hard about why something's missing. Right. And the missing completely at random um, phenomenon is rare. Right. Um, it's rare that everything has equal probability of being missing. So listwise deletion, you know, in the best case scenario, all it does is throw away information. Best case scenario, you're throwing away information. Um, worst case scenario, you're biasing things. We'll get through that. Uh, in your context, it doesn't sound like you made the wrong call. Um, but yeah, think about it. Most people just accept listwise deletion as a default and move on, right? And that's an approach I want you to rethink. Typically not the best idea. Okay. Sometimes let's propose a different model. Maybe dogs eat homework when students are studying too much, right? The dog's jealous, the dog wants to play. Why are you studying? Oh, the homework has your attention? I know what I'm gonna do, all right? So dogs, uh, are like any other creature and experience profound bits of jealous rage and decide to destroy homework non-randomly among students who study too much. Right? Let's assume that this is the data generating process. Now this is going to give us a whole different ballgame, right? Because now studying is correlated with both your performance on the homework and the likelihood that Doggo is going to eat that homework, right? So we're going to get higher likelihood that higher scoring students are going to be missing, right? The higher, the more you study, the more likelihood the dog is to eat it. So that means we're going to get systematic removal of um, students with 
uh, high scores on the homework. So let's simulate this. We're going to say for those students who were pretty heavy studiers, they had a value, remember our normal was centered at zero with the standard deviation of one. So we had negative values and positive values. I'm going to say for those students who had a study score of above 0 0.5, I'm sorry, if study is greater than zero, here's what we're doing. Uh, we're going to create a new vector P, and that's the probability that your homework is missing. So for those students who studied more than average, they have a 50% chance that the dogs can eat the homework. For those students who studied less than average, let's just assume that when they're not studying, they're playing with their dog all the time, uh, there's no chance that the dog's going to eat the homework. Okay? So if you study a lot, you've got a 50% chance the dog's going to eat your homework. If you don't study uh, a lot, then the dog's never going to eat your homework. We're going to simulate the dogs again, but now we're going to allow P, the probability that the dog eats your homework, to vary. Right? Uh, and we're going to say that. Uh, I actually think I might have just caught my code. Oh, sorry. I think this should be prob equals p. Um, so we'll kind of give that a second to recompile while I remove the cache now. Um, Sorry, I think the results I'm about to show you might be incorrect. Um, so I want to just update that. But um, because I said p equals p, but the way that the binomial distribution in R means p is with prob. Um, so I gave it the wrong argument, essentially. Maybe it worked and it understands p. Well, uh, I guess find out. But um, now we're going to allow the probability that the dog ate it to be variable, right? Some students have a high probability that the dog ate the homework. Some students have a low or have a zero probability that the dog ate the homework. Uh, again, the observed homework is equal to H. And then we remove missings when the dog ate it. Right? And this is what we observe. But this should actually pull the mean down. In this case, it looks like it did because those missings would have been high scores. Right? So the average value for homework here ought to be lower than it was here. Here it was 4.69. Here it's 4.27, so maybe that code did work correctly. That's kind of one way to think about whether it worked. I'm um, sorry, this is going to take a second to run just because we've got to compile uh, some HMC models. Um, but uh, I'll push the slides up later. We should see an impact on our inference here, right? We should see, because those high test score values were removed, we should see a negative bias in our estimate for the slope of S on H, right? Because what we've done if you take it, so the low test score kids are still in there and they have low test scores, but we've removed half of the high test score kids, right? And we've removed their value for S. So we don't allow that right hand side of the distribution that would have high test scores to pull the regression line up anymore. So it's going to attenuate that regression line. It's going to pull it down, right? Uh, and we could get bias in either direction. It could make it go up if we, if we flipped the effect and we made it that kids who don't study have dogs that eat their homework. But in this case, it's going to pull the regression line down a bit. Uh, so this is list-wise deletion. And we see this B is 2.39. And this is no list-wise deletion. We see a 2.30. Yeah, I don't think that my model worked correctly. So I'll, I'll update these slides, and we can see them later. Um, apologies for that. But in this case, we will get bias if we list-wise delete, right? Because the outcome is correlated with the missingness process, right? But in an imputation procedure, conditioning on S will correct it because S is the only thing determining whether the dog ate the homework, right? So if we condition on S, our model can sniff out, hey, it's only high study values where these are missing, and so based on the regression structure, and based on we know that the low study values have low scores, we can kind of populate that uncertainty about where those high test scores would have been, right? There's a source of bias here that we can see pretty clearly in the DAG, right? Study is now correlated with missingness, which determines whether or not we see the data in the first place. So if we don't condition on this somehow, then our inferences on the relationship between S and H are going to be biased. 
because those high values were systematically removed. Oh, we're good now. Um, Okay, well, came out the same, but we do see a slightly lower beta here than we see here. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but um, you're going to get bias. Trust me on that. I think I probably didn't run the models because they were cached, um, but I'll try and fix that later. Okay, so let's think about an unmeasured variable, right? So noisy homes make bad homework and bad dogs. Right, so if the home is noisy, the dog is likely to misbehave, and if the home is noisy, a student's ability, the quality of a student's study time is likely to decline. Right, there's some unmeasured variable X here that's simultaneously influencing the probability of missingness and the quality of the homework. This is missing not at random, right? We have some unmeasured variable that's systematically affecting the probability of missing this and is also correlated with other things in the system. So we can simulate this by allowing X uh, to be some normal variable, right? So some houses are noisy, some houses are not. For those houses where X is greater than one, uh, we're going to allow that to determine the missingness in the system, right? And we're gonna allow the probability that uh, homework is missing to be a function of study time and a function of X, right, noise. So we're basically going to allow, you know, those kids who study should have a higher score, but when the house is noisy, that score gets pulled down. Okay, and in this context, we get really bad inference. This is list-wise deletion, and this is no list-wise deletion. Right, so look at the interval that we get for this parameter. Uh, when we listwise delete, we get a 0.8 up to a 1.5 for beta S. And when we have the truth, we get a one to a two, right? So the location of that interval has moved. We have biased our inference by listwise deletion here. Now, if we have a good imputation model, we could potentially, because if we have a system where X is correlated with something else in the process, then maybe we can recover the uh, a valid interval for the true value of H. That's going to be tricky to do in this system because we don't have a predictor that's core that gives us information about X that we can leverage to use for imputation. This is going to be a system where it's really hard to get a valid inference on the outcome because we have a missing not at random process. Right, we have some unobserved value that's determining missingness, uh, and then it's going to make it really hard to impute. But this is a situation where, like, okay, maybe we need to go collect more data. Right? Maybe I need to go ask, is this a noisy household? And if I've got X, then I can condition on it, and I'm fine. Okay. Questions? Hey, Frank. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. So, if you were to be missing. Let's say you have age, you have race, you have experience, uh, you have like an array of variables, but you're just missing one variable on age. Can you use um, the values on the variables that aren't missing to predict? Yes. What is and that's what you were kind of getting to before. That's imputation. Yeah, that's that's the okay. that's the kind of stochastic imputation processes we're going toward. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we're going to build for. models for the missing data. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. That's where we're headed. We haven't gotten to imputation at all yet. But I'm just kind of describing missing data processes. But that's that's the that's the common uh, structure of data we're observing, where we have <coughs> an imputation process I'm working on right now is um, one where I want to know uh, a child's race or ethnicity in a foster care data system. Sometimes it's missing, um, but I have things like age and county of residence and sex and other things. So I can use population data from that county to help me make inferences about the likely race ethnicity of that child, in addition to information on other cases to kind of make, a, make an informed guess. But I'm not going to make one guess. I'm going to make like 10 guesses, right? And then I'm going to use the uncertainty I have about the location of that guesses in my model. But we'll get to, that's multiple imputation. We'll get there in a sec. Um, okay, so 
Uh, lastly, we have the worst kind of problem where we have uh, very good dogs who only eat bad homework, right? So they know that homework is garbage and they're just gonna eat it to save you from grief with the teacher, right? So homework scores here are correlated with the dog's decision to eat the homework, right? Now they're, they were correlated here, but conditional on X, right? So if we snip that X, then we have the information, then we remove the correlation between H and D, and we can get valid inference, right? But we would need the X to do it. Here, there's no way to condition it out when H is our outcome, right? So no amount of good data can help us here. Uh, we just have dogs that are interfering in the actual process, uh, unless we just know the truth and we could then maybe simulate it exactly as we're doing, right? Um, so in this context, we're going to say that if homework scores are less than five, the dog eats it with certainty, right? So any, any bad homeworks, the dogs just rush in, eat that homework before you have a chance to turn away. And that's a good dog. Um, so if we listwise delete, right, uh, our intercept is now 5.8, right? And if we look at the data, the mean test score now is 6.7, right? So we just moved our test score up from an average of like, uh, oh, that one's too. Um, we moved, you know, the average should be around five. Now the average is six and a half. Um, and if we look at our beta, for studying, right, we have a 1.13 to a 1.89 interval in the listwise deletion model, but in the true model, right, the beta for studying is between 2 and 2.5, right? So we have pretty severe bias induced by deletion in this context. But this is a case where we may not be able to correct it, right, because the dog is systematic in what rows it's removing from the data, and there's no other information we can get unless we observe the true value of the test score to recover what that might have been. Unless we know the data generating process, we can't really do anything here. Okay, so those are four kinds of missing data, right? We had the missing completely at random, right? Where nothing predicted the dog's likelihood of eating the homework. We had the missing at random, where study time predicted the dog's likelihood of eating the homework, but we measured study time so we can condition on it and then recover the likely range of those missing values. We had sound influencing the simultaneous uh, test score and the likelihood of missingness. And in this context, without observing X, we can't really recover the range of those values because this is missing not at random, when not at random means we don't observe the factor that's structuring missingness. But another kind of missing not at random is when the outcome itself is correlated with the missingness in a way that's not conditional on some other variable. And that's another context in which it's hard to get valid inference. But I hope I've convinced you that listwise deletion can really screw up your inference, right? That is what happens when we listwise delete in this missing not at random case. And this is what happens with uh, the true values, right? And even in that missing at random case I showed you, if I'd estimated the model appropriately, uh, you would have seen a bias in those regression results, right? Um, I'll make sure to push up those correct slides later. Uh, so listwise deletion only is harmless relatively. You're still not, it's not perfectly harmless because you're throwing away information. Um, the only time when it doesn't bias your inference is when the distribution of missingness is completely at random in the data, right? Meaning every row has the same likelihood of being missing. This is very, very rarely true in practice, right? So I want us to be very cautious about making the decision to listwise delete your data, right? That should only be done if you're absolutely convinced that the data generating mechanism removes cases at random, right? Or survey respondents just don't respond with some fixed probability. Nothing about that respondent predicts whether they're gonna not respond or not, right? Generally, we can't defend that assumption, right? That's, a, that's an assumption that's really hard to defend unless we know the process that generated the data. 
So it's, it's a good idea to assume the data are either missing at random, meaning they're missing conditional on something else that we can observe, or missing not at random, meaning it's missing conditional on something we can't observe, right? And uh, if we can make a good case that we have thought through the likely patterns of missingness, we think we have some measures that should be correlated with missingness. Like we know that the very rich and the very poor are likely to underreport their income. So maybe we could use some other set of measures to make inferences about, well, what neighborhood does this person live in? What's their home value? What's their occupation? Oh, that person's rich, right? I, I know that that person's likely to have been rich because they have some other set of predictors that are correlated with being rich. And so the likelihood that that value is missing is higher, but we also know probably the kind of range within that value was likely to fall, right? And we can build a regression model to do that. We don't necessarily need to populate our theory exactly like that, but as you're explaining to your readers why you made the choices you made, you should really think carefully about what the process was. Uh, okay. Yeah. So when you say you populate, so you say like, for example, a rich person is, miss, is not reporting their income, I'm going to put into the model a certain range where I think that value would have been, and the model is going to use it to kind of no, push I'm the not, estimate. No, I'm not going to put the range in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to specify a regression, right? That where I'm going to predict income based on some other set of factors, and then the regression model is going to set that range based on the posterior predicted distribution. Right. So I'm not ever going to say, I know the value falls in this range. What I'm going to say is, I know a system that predicts income based on other variables, right? And that, that system that predicts income then will populate the uncertainty we have based on the posterior predictive distribution of where that value could have been. And then that range of possible posterior predictive values is going to get folded in as another source of uncertainty into the model. That sounds crazy. I'm going to walk you through how to do it. Um, but that's effectively what we're going to do is exactly what we did for measurement error. I'm not going to say this is the exact range of it. I'm going to say, here's where I think it could have been. But in this context, I'm actually going to give it a set of regression predictors that say um, income is a function of age, place of residence, occupation, whatever I have. And that model is going to predict out where income could have been. And it's going to do it many, many times. Right, so we're going to get different values of possible income, and those different values of possible income each get run through the model. Right, and so that makes our inferences more uncertain, which is exactly what we want to do, despite it sounding like something we don't want to do. It's honest, at least. Uh, okay, so other questions about this? Missing data mechanisms? We're going to get to imputation in a second, and the method of what we'll actually do why data are missing. Okay. The key takeaway is missing completely at random and missing at random, we can typically deal with. Missing not at random, we typically cannot deal with. And then we just need better data, right? List-wise deletion isn't the answer, imputation isn't the answer, better data is the answer in that context. In a case where, for example, police departments don't tell you how many people they killed in a year, because they killed a lot of them, right? We can't learn anything about a, a case where we have data like that. We need better data, right? Which is what has opened up the possibility of doing research in that area is the existence of better data. Okay. Um, cool. So we're gonna start with Bayesian imputation and then we're gonna talk about multiple imputation after that. These are separate methods, right? But they have similar kind of rationale. One is a fully Bayesian approach that's totally consistent with everything we've been doing all semester. One is a, a kind of pseudo Bayesian approach that gets used in frequentist inferences, but we can use in a Bayesian context. Despite the book telling you not to use it, um, it's fine. Um, I think it, 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 it's not as principled as going the fully Bayesian route, but in practice, it'll work. Um, okay. So much like with measurement error, we can treat those missing values as parameters that we're going to estimate from the model, right? We can treat missing data as an unobserved parameter that has some prior probability distribution, has some likelihood, and then when we smush the likelihood and the prior together, we get a posterior that tells us after we've looked at the data, uh, where do we think that this missing value was? Um, so Hamiltonian Monte Carlo samples continuous missing measure as well. 
It doesn't sample discrete variables as well, meaning categoricals, right? So the procedure for Bayesian imputation I'm going to show you is awesome when we have a continuous missing value, right? You're going to run into trouble if we have a categorical missing value, right? So I told you I was trying to impute race and ethnicity. Uh, the book gives an example of how we could do this. You can see section 15.3, but it's very technical and probably more trouble than it's worth because there are other approaches that we can use to address that that are not quite as principled, but a little easier to work with. So I'm gonna use BRM for all these examples, but um, the book, uh, especially 15.2.2, has an example using Oolong. The BRM approach is just so easy to use that I don't think it's worth working through the Oolong example right now. And it's effectively gonna do the same thing. It's just gonna handle a lot of the setup for us. Um, okay. So if you have continuous missing data, um, meaning you know it's it's on a negative infinity to infinity scale, or it's on some you know continuous uh, scale, then Bayesian imputation is fantastic, right? Because we can treat it like a normally distributed missing parameter or a multivariate normally distributed missing parameter and sample it directly. For continuous measures or for categorical measures, it, it's a lot trickier. Okay, so we're going to use this um, National Health Activities Nutrition Survey. Um, this is built into the MICE package, and MICE is the multiple imputation software we're going to be using. So if you want to follow along, you can install the MICE package now. Uh, and it's the NHANES data. Uh, so it contains four, four measures, age, uh, BMI, the body mass index. Uh, hype is the presence or absence of hypertension, and it takes on one and two values. And CHL is cholesterol. Right? And you can see that we've got missingness on BMI, on hypertension, and on cholesterol. Right? We have uh, a binary categorical measure, and then two continuous measures, BMI and CHL. Age, we're going to treat as continuous, despite the fact that it only takes on three values here, one, two, and three. And that's just the wave of the survey. Right? This was a survey at baseline, at wave two, and at wave three that we're calling age. I assume that people were recruited at the same age at the beginning of the survey, and so they, that age is a kind of equivalent gap for each of them. Um, okay, questions about this data? No? Cool? Okay. So uh, let's do a list-wise solution model, right? Uh, so uh, we're going to make BMI a function of age and cholesterol, okay? Uh, so BMI is going to increase as you get older, and it's going to increase with higher cholesterol values. Sure, that sounds fine. I'm not a nutritionist, but uh, that's the model we're going to estimate, right? Now remember, we have some missingness here. So all those values where BMI is missing are going to get excluded, and all those values where cholesterol are going to get excluded. At most, that's going to be 19 cases, but sometimes they're going to be jointly missing. So it's, you know, minimum is 10, maximum is 19 in terms of how many rows we're going to lose. Um, so that's the model output we get. That's fine. But we can sample, we can impute those missing values by sampling them with HMT, right? So we can sample BMI by doing exactly what we did with the measurement error model by putting on the left hand side a pipe and the MI function, but in this case, we don't have a standard error for BMI, we just know it's missing. So we want to multiply impute it, and we're gonna use age and cholesterol to predict those missing values, right? Which is gonna be similar to what we would've done anyway, we're just gonna sample them from the posterior, right, after estimation, and then fold those back into the estimation. So it's kind of an iterative process where it's gonna sample all the parameters, predict out BMI, fold that back in, use that to estimate new parameters, fold it back in, you know, right, that iterative process we get with Markov chain Monte Carlo. And we're gonna get posteriors for each missing value. Uh, here, we're still gonna lose data because we're not dealing with cholesterol, right? Cholesterol's got some missingness, but we're gonna address the BMI. Okay, we get posteriors for each missing value, just as we did in the measurement error model. And uh, we'll specify likelihoods and priors for each of those explicitly here. I'm letting DRM set default priors, but typically we should think a little more carefully about what we want our priors to do. Right, so how do we address missingness on cholesterol 2, right? So we've already seen this approach. We say multiply impute it with this model, right? And that's not a problem for Bayes because it's just one more parameter it needs to sample. It's a little more complicated when we have another predictor that's also missing. Right? 
because we need to set predictors for what we want to fold in to help us understand why cholesterol is missing. So now we need a model with more than one likelihood, just as we had in the Ulam model with multiple missing values. But here, uh, instead of just having a standard error on the data, we actually want to specify a full linear predictor for why cholesterol is missing. Um, so the way we do that is we use this BF function. So we're actually going to, this is called a multivariate regression, right, where we have more than one likelihood feeding into it. And we've done this with ULAM already, but this is the first time you're seeing it with DRM. Um, so we're going to set missing values in BMI to be a function of age and cholesterol. But we also want to note in the model that we want those missing values from cholesterol to be accounted for in our BMI model. And we're going to set cholesterol to be a second regression outcome, right? That's a function that, that's missing as, as a function of age. So we're going to say that cholesterol increases as you age, and that's the only thing we're going to put into it. We could specify a more complex model. We could say hypertension is in there too, right? We could put age in there. We could put BMI in there too, right? Um, but then we're folding additional missing data in, and so it gets a little more complex. This is a simple example. Now for each missing variable, we specify a regression formula that tells us what predicts that value, right? And that's not predicting, it's predicting both whether it's missing and predicting the value of it once we impute that, right? And these are going to run simultaneously. So the missing values from cholesterol as they get imputed go in to predicting our values for BMI, right? Because remember this is HMC and we're going to be jointly sampling all of these parameters at the same time, and it's going to kind of bounce our, our, our inferences around, right? We're going to kind of trace out this multivariate sampling space. With this. Okay, now to run the model, we've created a formula object where BF just stands for Bayes formula. So we have one formula object here plus another formula object here. That gets called formula two. And then I tell it to estimate a model with formula two, which has two separate linear predictors in it. Right, and we're going to use the NHANES data. So now it's got a model with two outcomes and two separate linear formulas. That sounds kind of wild, but we're in Bayes land and we can do this. Right, uh, we can have a model with a bunch of outcomes. We're not restricted to two. And if we have, if we wanted to include hypertension, which also had missingness in it, we would have a third model as part of this. So the setup looks a little funky but it's relatively straightforward, right? Here's the output for it. So note now that we have an intercept for BMI and an intercept for cholesterol, right? Because we estimated a separate model for cholesterol to predict out those missing values. We get a coefficient on age for BMI and a coefficient on age for cholesterol. And then we use those missing values for cholesterol to predict BMI, right? That vector that includes both the observed and the missings predicts out BMI. You know, we get some sigmas that tell us about the correlations of the, of the uh, missing values as well. So, you know, this is a relatively compact way for us to do a Bayesian imputation of continuous measures. Um, compared to the approach we'd need to take with Ulam, there would be a lot more code in Ulam to set this up and some raw SAN code to set this up too. Uh, so this is a bit easier to work with. And I think this is an approach that if you have missing this only on continuous measures, this is the approach I would use. But a lot of times we have missing this on non-continuous measures. Oh, right, let's kind of just show you a little bit more about what's going on here. Um, so I just uh, wanted to show you the density for our missing value. This is observation 10, right? Uh, you can see I just pulled out, I took posterior samples. Let's see if I can show you what this looks like. Uh, wrong post. Okay. Yeah, MT wasn't compiled, so I won't mess with that. But um, so now when we take the posterior samples from M2, right, this being M2, um, we have parameters for, we saw, we have two intercept parameters. For BMI and cholesterol. We have two age parameters for BMI and cholesterol, and we have a cholesterol parameter 
uh, for BMI, right? Um, in terms of a, a beta predictor. Uh, but we also have nine posterior uh, parameters for, for missing BMI values and 10 uh, posterior distributions for missing cholesterol values, right? And we can pull those out individually and take a look at them. Here is what the BMI was missing on row 10. And here's what the posterior distribution for it looks like, right? Uh, and remember that we used cholesterol and age to predict this. So if you were older, right, we estimated a negative uh, relationship between BMI and age. So if you're older, your BMI goes, you know, I, I don't know what this age group is, but sure. Uh, and so in this case, this is adjusting for that regression line, right? But we predict BMI to be anywhere in this range. Each of these was a sample the model drew, right? So it drew samples as low as 10 and as high as 45, but most of the samples were in the like 25 range, right? So it made educated guesses about where BMI could have been based on what it saw in the data and based on our regression model, right? And this is the range of guesses that it made. And each of these guesses got folded into our estimates for the other parameters in the model, right? This got treated as if it were a value of BMI, the same as an observed value of BMI. But now it took on this wide possible range. And each missing value gets a posterior like this. So it's an additional source of uncertainty that just gets averaged into our model, the same as other kinds of uncertainty. It's pretty nice. So the pros of Bayesian imputation, right? We can allow for very complex structures in our models. So for example, if we had a multi-level model, there's no reason we couldn't specify each imputation to have some complex multi-level structure. No reason at all, right? Uh, we can build in as complex of a model structure we want into the missing data process. That gets more difficult with other imputation procedures. Uh, we can neatly specify variable specific models for the missing data, right? So we got to specify a different model for cholesterol than we did for BMI. There's no reason we can't use theory to inform, well, this is what should predict cholesterol, this is what should predict BMI, this is what should predict hypertension. Given what data we've got, we can build out different predictive models for each of them. And sampling those missing values using HMC is totally consistent with the modeling principles we've been using, right? We're folding it into the same process, um, and that makes a lot of good, clean theoretical sense. The cons are it gets technically complex really quickly, right? So for more complex models, for models with categorical outcomes, it gets hard. Um, and it can get really computationally intensive for large data sets, right? So a challenge I'm working with now is I'm trying to make inferences at a state level with individual level data where there's missingness at the individual level. Right, so building a model that accounts for individual level missingness to make a state level inference when I've got tens of millions of observations is gonna take months to run. Um, so it can get computationally, like other Bayesian methods, it can get computationally difficult with large data sets. And this makes the problem more challenging. So we have an alternative called multiple imputation. Uh, and we're gonna show multiple imputation by chained equations. Now, what multiple imputation differs from, from um, the, the fully Bayesian approach is that we're not going to simultaneously estimate the uh, missing data in the model. We're going to do it in separate steps, right? So a first step will be to uh, construct models for our missing data. The second step will be to estimate the models, right? So we're going to deal with the missing data separately than estimating our final model, right? The downside here is the information that flows across priors and likelihoods uh, and, and the posterior distribution doesn't get pooled in the same way it would in a Bayesian model, right? Um, but it's a kind of pseudo Bayesian approach because what we're going to do is we're going to build up models for each of our missing, uh, for each of our, each, each of our parameters that's missing, each of our variables that's missing, um, and we're going to predict out, we're basically going to simulate possible values for each of those, right? Um, You'll see a lot of times in practice, people will restrict this to like five uh, missing values. And for frequentist models, that's fine. We're going to go for a much higher number in base because what we actually want to do is we're going to kind of generate a distribution that reflects our uncertainty about the missingness, right? Just as we would do in a Bayesian approach. 
uh, multiple imputation kind of gives us a framework that's um, theoretically consistent with that approach, if not computationally consistent with that approach, right? Um, so multiple imputation by chained equations uh, uses MCMC. And what it does is it creates uh, K new data sets, right? K predictions for each unobserved variable based on fully conditional regression models. So each variable is going to be a function of every other variable in the model, right? And we can um, specify a little bit about the functional format that'll take. Uh, we can, and we can, we can kind of relax that. We're going to make conditional predictions. So we're going to make a prediction for, let's say that BMI is missing. We're going to make a prediction for BMI based on every other variable in the model, right? Uh, and then we're going to do that K times, right? So we're going to set K, here I'm going to set K at around 20. So we're going to make 20 predictions where uh, that value could have been. And then we're going to apply the analysis we're going to use over each data set, and we're going to pool the results across those data sets, right? So we're going to effectively run K regression models. We're going to get K data sets, we're going to run K models, and then we're going to combine the results to update our inferences and basically account for the uncertainty we've got and where those locations are. Um, so this paper is a great uh, description of the software we're going to use. We're going to use the MICE package. Um, in R um, by Steph Van Buren. Sorry, that closed out. Um, but yeah, if you want to, sorry, here's the paper. Um, it's actually a pretty accessibly written paper if you want a detailed description of the methods and the implementation. And MICE is great in that there's a really good series of vignettes to accompany the software. So if you go to the help page for MICE on CRAN, you'll get about seven or eight vignettes that walk you through in detail how to use this software. It's really nice. Um, okay, so this is, I think, in, MICE is industry standard in R for handling missing data. Uh, so we'll work through briefly how to use it in this context. So again, yeah. I have a question. I'm a bit confused because in the previous example, we did the imputation, but did we attach it to the data that we have already? No. No. So we're was... just doing imputations. Yeah, which are just building a model of the missing data. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. Yeah, no, that's right. What we're doing here is, is so in the Bayesian approach, we're just treating the missing data as an additional parameter that we need to sample from the model, right? It's folded into the estimation procedure, right? So we've run our model and we've done. Yep, at the uh, same time. Okay. Okay. Bayesian imputation does both at the same time. Okay. It just treats them as another parameter it needs to sample. So it doesn't, there's not a, a first or second step in this, right? In, in the right. imputation procedure, we run the model at the same time as we impute the data. And those imputations update the parameter estimates as it goes, right? So now okay. each step of the imputation, each step of the HMC draw samples the 10 missing values on BMI, samples a parameter for the intercept, samples a parameter for age, samples a parameter for cholesterol. Each of them jointly informs where the next step is going to go. Okay, but we didn't assign priors or anything? We did. I, I let that be in the background here. Okay. Yeah, we would need to assign... We, we went with the default priors then. Yeah, for that, your, um... yeah, I let it be the default priors. If you want to okay. see the full model specification, 15.2.2 uh, in the book, walks through mm -hmm. the full specification of this model. It gets lengthy, so I, I kind of left it out here. Okay. Yeah. BRM will make sensible default choices for things where we don't have good, it, that where we're not explicitly trying to fold prior information into the model. And you can extract priors from BRM with the prior summary function. So mm -hmm. um, let's see what I've got in my environment. Um, So I can use prior summary to ask BRM what priors were you were you using, right? And it'll tell me what those priors that it set were. Um, and so the explicitly specific. What's that? And so the difference between mice and this is that mice doesn't run your model while you're doing the imputation at the same time. You first do the imputation and put it somehow on the data, and then run your model. We're breaking okay. that that step apart. That's exactly cool. right. We're going to pre-process the data, and then we're going to use that pre-processed data to estimate our models. 
Okay, thank you. As opposed to doing imputation and model fitting in the same step. So we can see why principle, if, if we just want to go on what's cleaner, right, what makes kind of more sense in terms of less potential places for things to go wrong, um, then the Bayesian approach is the right approach. But again, it gets technically difficult uh, when we have categorical predictors or categorical missingness. Um, so, you know, this is the approach you should use if you can, right? But if you can't for some reason, then I want to show you the other. And also, if you're running frequentist models, this isn't even an option, right? So we're going to show you multiple imputations anyway. Um, so uh, with multiple imputations, if we're running 10 imputations, right, we're generating 10 values for each missing, that means, in effect, we're getting 10 data sets, 10 new data sets. Each of them could be, you know, where, where each missing data set is a possible value for each, each, uh, each missing value in it. So it's going to give us a filled-in value for everything that was missing in that data in one of them. And in the second one, it's going to give me a different value for where that missing value could have been. And if we kind of extend this up to get like 100 of them, then we'll actually have a distribution on each of them. Right, or close enough to a distribution on each of them. There's been some research simulating this out and shown that it's, you know, gives you similar inferences to Bayesian imputation procedures for high values of k. The challenge can be where the Bayesian imputation procedure really shines is if we have more complex model specifications. Those get difficult to work. If we have like a really complicated multi level specification, that's not very easy to do with mice, but it is quite easy to do with a Bayesian imputation. Okay, this is all it takes to impute that data. Load in mice, run the mice function on the nHANES data, tell it how many imputations I want. I was calling it K, mice calls it M, and tell, many, tell me how long I want my chains to be, max iteration, right? And then I get some output for the missing data that you didn't see there, but I get trace plots. And these are things you wanna take a look at when you impute data. Now we've been doing Bayesian inference, so we know how to look at a trace plot. What do I want to see? It's centered in the middle, but it looks like it's all over the place. <laughs> but that's what I want to see, right? right I'm right. looking at an MCMC chain. I want to see that it's exploring the sample space efficiently. It's not getting stuck in any particular zone. It's considering all possible values that are reasonable for that outcome that exist within you know, the, the, the sample space for the posterior. I want to see it exploring that posterior efficiently. I have the average value here and I have the standard deviation here. So it tells me about both how variable that BMI value was and where it was landing on average for it. And I want to see the same kind of fuzzy caterpillar pattern I see with a Markov chain. I want to see it kind of going all over the sample space. I don't want to see it getting hung up in one area. I want to see it jumping around. And I want to see the chains mixing. I want to see them on top of each other and kind of exploring the same space, right? So this looks good. This looks like a healthy imputation. I would trust this, right, based on just checking out the convergence diagnostic. Okay, so now we had those 10 missing BMIs. We, we also here, because we didn't tell it otherwise, it went ahead and imputed uh, hypertension, right? But you'll notice a problem with hypertension, potentially. Hy well, actually, in this case, it's not going to be a problem because of the algorithm it used. But hypertension was a one or two, right? So if it were treated as continuous, we would get impossible values imputed there. Uh, and cholesterol uh, was continuous. And you can see kind of the range that the imputation values took. Okay. Cool? Cool on convergence diagnostics? You always want to check these when you're running these kinds of models. We can also do a strip plot, and this is kind of funky. What it's going to do is plot the imputed values over the observed values, right? So this is for cholesterol, and we're running it across. You can see here, uh, I ran 11, no, the observed is included in here as the first. I ran 10 imputations. Um, so I got 10 new data sets, where the first column here is just the observed data. The blue dots are observed, the red dots are imputed. Now, 
you might think this looks a little funky because those red dots are all exactly over blue, blue dot. And that's a function of the algorithm that MICE is using here. It's called partial mean matching. And so what it's doing is a little funky. What it does is it fits the regression model of everything conditional and everything else. Right? In this case, we have uh, the four predictors. We have, uh, or I'm sorry, we have yeah, age is not missing at all, so it's not going to get imputed, but we have four predictors. We have age, BMI, hypertension, and cholesterol. The model it's going to fit is BMI. The linear function is going to be BMI equals some intercept plus a beta on age plus a beta on hypertension plus a beta on cholesterol, right? And then it's going to make, it's going to sample out betas from the probability distribution of whatever posterior it gets for those betas to draw a new beta. And then it's going to make a prediction from the, it's going to draw from the posterior predictive distribution for BMI, conditional on everything else. And then what partial mean matching is going to do is it's going to say, take all of the nearest values in the observed data that are close to that prediction and draw one of them and impute the missing value exactly equal to one of those randomly drawn near neighbors, which means that the imputed values under partial mean matching will only take on values that we actually observe in the data. Now, Sometimes this is really good, right? Like if we were to look at, let's just rerun this so I can show you how it would work with um, hypertension. Um, so you can see it's kind of giving us output that looks like what we see with an MCMC -MC sampler, but where it's telling you iteration and chain, and it's kind of running through those samples. Uh, this is the output we can see that it tells us the methods it used with summary, and it used PMM for all of them. That's partial mean matching. That's a default it uses. And it also gives us a predictor matrix, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. That tells us what the specification of the regression model was for each. Now, here's that strip plot again. Let's look at hypertension. This is a case where it's a really good thing. Hypertension can only take on the value of one or two, but I didn't tell the model hey, this is binary, right? Because it's using that partial mean matching algorithm, it's gonna fit the linear regression model, and then it's gonna make predictions for where that value should be, and then it's gonna find a nearest neighbor and then randomly sample one of those nearest neighbors to, fit our, to put our imputed value on. And that's where the uncertainty is gonna come in. So this method is gonna give me only ones and twos, right? Because that's all that it observes in the data. But we could run into a problem with like cholesterol where this is truly continuous, right? Uh, now it's gonna confine us to the sample space where we, uh, the kind of range of plausible values that, you know, it's not gonna give us impossible values, but maybe there were some people who were missing who might have been in this like 250 to 300 range and the model made it impossible to actually sample in that space because of partial mean matching. So when we have a ton of data, this makes a lot of sense on a continuous measure. But when we don't have a ton of data, this PMM method might not be great. Um, so one thing we can do, I'm just going to show you this, and then we'll work through it in the lecture, is we can actually switch out our method, right? So let's uh, extract from imp in Haynes, which is the name of my imputation object, which contains a bunch of stuff in it. If you want to see what it contains, uh, it contains both that from the summary, but it also has uh, imputations in there. These are all the things it's got. Is it imp? Yeah, these are the imputed data sets, right? Uh, so we can extract those. If we want to just like pull out those in, in those those uh, m imputed data sets, the k imputed data sets, I can use the complete function. I'm going to call it temp here. I can complete um, imp in Haynes. Type that one. So now head temp is going to, wait, that didn't work. Oh, I need to specify mice complete. Uh, dplyr has a complete function. Um, um, do I need to tell it action equals long? There it is. Okay, so action equals long will give me a long data set. And now, Right, in row, in Haynes, 
had 25 in row temp will have 250. Right, so now my object has each of those 10 imputed data sets built on top of it. And you can see imputation one at the head and imputation 10 at the bottom. Right, so now we've got a stacked data frame where dot imp is an identifier for which imputation it came out of in the model. So, okay, so that's one thing we could do. Now we can use meth, uh, method to extract the method it used for each of our imputations each of our variables in the imputation, right? So it's gonna give us age, it didn't impute because it wasn't missing. BMI, it used PMM, which is partial mean matching. Hypertension, it used PMM, partial mean matching. Cholesterol, it used PMM, partial mean matching. But I wanna use a linear model for cholesterol because I didn't get values that I wanted to see, right? It was really confined in that strip plot, right? To only what we observed in the data. So let's say I just want to use a Bayesian linear regression model to predict out with a Gaussian likelihood, a normal likelihood. I can change the method to normal. And then I can tell it that the methods I want to use for prediction are contained in this object that I've called math, right? But it could be called anything. Let's rerun the imputation model now. Okay, now if I look at imp in Haynes 3, string dollar sign method, you'll see that it switched the method for cholesterol to normal. And let's look at the strip plot again. Okay, now with cholesterol, what do we see? Before, it was predicting exactly on those we observed, but now it's predicting in the gaps, right? We're not using that partial mean matching algorithm anymore, so we're allowing the regression model to predict values that we didn't observe, right? Because the regression model doesn't care what we observed, it just cares about the line. Now, the downside to this is that we're predicting really low cholesterol values for some people that are probably impossible, and also really high values for some people that might be impossible. Right, so the 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 linear the normal you know the normal regression model isn't constrained to what we saw in the data. It can predict outside of the data. Sometimes that's really good in you know cases where we want to predict between observations, but it can also be bad in that we're predicting beyond potentially the actual actually believable range of the data. Right, so PMM is a nice method for constraining it to believable values but that can go too far. Okay, um, I, we're gonna come back around to the method thing in a second. But um, I can also change the predictors that feed in to a particular measure in the model, right? So let's say that I don't want um, hypertension to predict cholesterol. No, actually, okay, so let's say I have, um, I want cholesterol to be one measure, but then there's some other index that includes cholesterol in it. Let's say that, um, they make a like cholesterol plus BMI index as some indicator of something, and that's called CHL BMI in the data. Now, if I include that as a predictor of cholesterol and BMI in the data, it's a linear combination of those things, so it's going to be perfectly correlated with them, right? We're going to have severe collinearity, and the model's going to break. Um, so we might need to exclude it from the model. We can extract a predictor matrix that tells us the specification of each of the regression models from an imputation object like this. So I can take my NHANES imputation object, dollar sign predictor matrix, to get the thing that we saw in summary, right? We saw that at the bottom, predictor matrix. That tells us what goes into the regression model. So if I want to get that out, I just need to extract that from the object, okay? And let's call it red. So now I have a predictor matrix stored. Now let's say I want to turn off uh, the imputation of, so, so what we have here is in effect a uh, regression formula. We're saying that age is a function of, well, it's not a function of age because that's perfectly collinear, but it's a function of BMI, 
hypertension and cholesterol. So the row tells us the outcome, the column tells us which predictors are turned on for that model. For BMI, age is turned on, hypertension is turned on, cholesterol is turned on. We're always going to have zeros on the diagonal because we don't want something to predict itself. Uh, for hypertension, everything is turned on. But, so let's say that we want to turn off um, cholesterol as a predictor of hypertension. How would I do that? So I could say, Fred, and let's say um, the row name is hypertension, the column name is cholesterol. I want that to be zero. Now, that cell is switched to zero. And that means if I give this as a predictor matrix to mice, it's not going to use cholesterol to predict hypertension anymore. So sometimes we might have you know, some reasons that we want to include or exclude particular variables in an imputation model, and this is the way we can turn them on and turn them off. The cases where you're most going to see this is when we have strong collinearity, when some variable is a combination of other variables, or when you have a factor with lots of levels. You typically want to turn those off. I, in my kind of experience, a factor with like 10 levels, if you've got a lot of data, is okay. But once you get to 50, it's, it's, it's not going to fit the model very well because it's going to do a no pooling model at that point, And you may not have enough information to really do that. And that might not be what you want. Right? There are multi-level specifications you can use, but they're not awesome in mice. Um, at that point, you might be better, better off just sticking with the fully Bayesian approach. Um, okay. Questions about that predictor matrix? It's a little complicated, but if you want to mess with what gets turned on and turned off in mice, this is how you do it as predictors. Okay. So I can give it a predictor matrix for imputation by saying predictor matrix equals this object pred that I've created, right? So I, I ran the imputation model once, I extracted the predictor matrix, I set one cell to zero, and I reran it. There's no reason I couldn't say, hey, cholesterol is a bad predictor for everything. Just turn it off. I could set the whole column to zero, and it, cholesterol won't get used as a predictor for anything. By default, it's going to include everything as a predictor of everything else, because we know that typically you get better predictions with more data in the model, right? With more variables means, means better predictions. Um, doesn't mean better inference, but it does mean better predictions most of the time. Um, okay. That's how we use it. Um, right, so partial mean matching is the default. Uh, we kind of talked through that algorithm briefly. Uh, and partial mean matching is a good default for most cases, but there are some cases where we're going to want to change it. Um, so if you want to see a full list of methods available to you, you can click through here. This is the um, MICE documentation. And these are all of the methods that are available within MICE uh, that you can choose from. I don't know what Midas touch means, but that is maybe a new default that they're working on, I assume, based on the very geeky name that they gave it. Um, but if you wanted to use the a normal regression model, uh, where you just wanted to use the posterior predictions directly, then norm is your method. If you wanted to use a logistic regression model and make uh, you know, the uh, posterior predictions from the logit model, then this is how you'd do it. Um, you might see the polyreg if you have a multi-value categorical missing, right? That's uh, something that you'll see. Um, there's also, a, I think, two level variables. But anyway, the documentation on mice is great. I do encourage you, if you get confused, to work through it. Um, okay, that's how we change methods. I already covered that. Okay, so we often want to check out what our data look like after imputation. So it has a built-in plotting function that you can just use density plot on an imputation object. The blue is the observed, the red is the imputed, right? So in this case, uh, what we wanna see, if we have data missing completely at random, the data should, the imputation should have a similar distribution to the observed, right? But if the data are missing at random, meaning something's correlated with the missingness, then the posterior density may not be exactly equal to the uh, observed density, right? And that, that can be a good thing, right? It might be the case that a particular value of a data uh, of, a, of, of, a, of a variable was less likely to be observed because something was correlated with its missingness. And in that case, what we get from the imputation should be different from what we had in the observed, right? Because there was something systematic pushing the data. Um, if it's just missing at random, then the density should look relatively similar. 
So this is with the normal data. And you notice with the cholesterol, right, we're actually able to recover the distribution of the observed pretty nicely. But if I were to look at the one with the partial mean matching, you're going to see a funky density. Um, and that's kind of why I switched it out, right? So if we look at just the one where we use partial mean matching on cholesterol, notice the peaks there are really high on those observed values because it's effectively getting treated as if the only possible values for cholesterol are what we observe. And I felt like it was taking those peaks to be uh, entirely too high by reproducing those values. And I felt better about a density using the normal likelihood that appeared to recover the shape of the observed data a little better because it was kind of spreading out the probability there. Um, but this is a good way to check what your data did. Now, again, if your imputations don't look like your observes, that can be okay, right? Um, and in a lot of cases, like where the dog ate homework, uh, when students were uh, studying too much, we would expect that the imputation of the missing data would not look exactly like the observed data, right? Because the missing mechanism was biasing, was biased toward high values of test scores, right? Uh, yeah. So would you then look at these distributions and try and get uh, some sense as to what might be happening, or is that pushing it too far? I so yeah. I mean, you again, you want to have a strong theory for why your data are missing, right? And so you know what you see in the density plots should line up with your story about why the data are missing. If in this case, this this looks like a case where I have no idea about these data. But based on this, it looks like the data were missing completely at random, right? It looks like the posterior imputations are lining up pretty closely to the observe. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have any reason to think that there was correlation among, you know, predictors. I could look at it and, and kind of get a better sense. But, yeah, you just need to think about the missing data mechanisms carefully. But seeing a different density for the imp imputations relative to the observed doesn't mean the applications didn't work. Right? And go ahead. Oh, oh, and and is there something you can or should do to, for example, remove those in the normal distribution for cholesterol to try and constrain it into reliable, into reasonable values? No, I, I wouldn't mess with that too much. PMM is the method you should go if you want to constrain it into reasonable values, right? The PMM algorithm did that for us. Um, and in, in a case, in a data, this only has 25 rows. If I had 250 observations of cholesterol, I would have better spread. And then I would have more potential cells that I could use to kind of impute those values on. I wouldn't base, I switched over to the normal method. I wouldn't mess with it. Um, you know, there are ways I could think about doing log normals or something different like that. Um, but typically, the more I try and constrain the imputations, the harder it makes it for it to run, and the more I've introduced potential sources of bias that I may not fully understand or appreciate. So if you're really concerned about not putting impossible values in your model, then just stick with the PMM default, because that never will. It'll only give you values that were actually observed. And it does so in a way that you know, still populates uncertainty, because it, it, there's, there's a sort of random process in terms of which value it chooses to be the imputed value. It's a kind of bootstrapping. Um, OK, cool. Now, uh, I know we're running out of time, so I want to cover this. Um, after imputation, what do we do? We've got these 10 data sets. So in a frequentist context, what we do is we fit 10 regression models, right? So here. The width function says, take imp, imp and Haynes 3 and run a linear regression model over each of the imputed data sets. So fit here is going to have 10 regression models in it, right? So let's run this and see what we get. So what's fit? Fit is a list with 10 regression models. So fit 1. Is one regression model you can see fit nine gives us the formula, gives us the coefficients and intercept. Fit 10 gives us the formula and the coefficients and intercepts. Fit eight does the same. So we've got 10 regression models here. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to fit a separate model over each of these imputed data sets. 
Now, um, statistician named Rubin came up with these methods and came up with methods for combining the data set. Effectively, in a frequentist context, for our parameters, we average them. And for the standard errors, we do a weighted average where we weight by how much variance there is across the data set. And it's pretty easy to do. In mice, you just say pool fits. And then it will give us the weighted average of those parameters across imputations, along with, uh, I think, so there's the t-test. Um, I'd need to kind of think about exactly how to interpret these for a second, but there's our pooled beta. I don't remember what u bar is, but uh, there's a t value uh, if we wanted to do a uh, hypothesis test on it, right? Um, so yeah, uh, the documentation will explain how to interpret those pooled values, right? We can go question pool. But it's going to take those 10 imputed data sets and then use Rubin's rules to compile them. And it'll walk us through what that output means. Um, now, in a Bayesian context, right, what we want to do is we don't want to pool the estimates directly. What we want to do is we want to fit the separate models on each of the imputed data sets. We want to sample the posteriors. And then we just smush those posterior samples together and draw intervals, treat that as our full posterior, right? So it's actually a, quite a bit easier conceptually to do this in a Bayesian context because we fit the separate models, we draw posterior samples, and we just stick them together, and that becomes our full posterior, right? So in practice, what we get is with a single model, let's say we might get 500 samples from a posterior for a given sample, but now I've got 10 models, so now I've got 10 times 500. I've got 5,000 samples to describe my posterior, right? So those samples just get smushed together, and that becomes our new posterior density. Right, and the way we can do that in BRM has a built-in function called BRM multiple that can do this. And it uses the same syntax as BRM, but we give it as a data object, a mice imputation object. And then it will compile the model once, fit it to each of the imputed data sets and pool the posteriors, right? And then if we wanna know like the 89% quantile, we just take of those 5,000 posterior samples, what's the 89% interval for that, right? It's a pretty straightforward approach. Now we could do this manually with a loop, right? I could just fit the model 10 times, draw posterior samples, and bind them all together, and then do whatever posterior inference I want to do for that. And that's how you would do it with Ulam, right? But BRM has a nice built-in function to do that. This is the output we get, right? It looks just the same as anything else because it can pool those estimates just fine and draw intervals just fine, right? In a Bayesian context, that's super easy to do because we just stick the posterior samples together. Um, but now you can see before, right, we would have had, uh, I, I believe, 4,000 posterior samples in each because we had 1,000 draws from each of um, four chains. Now we've got 40,000 because it's running at 10 times, right? So for each parameter in the model, now we've got 40,000 samples in the posterior to work from. So it's a much bigger posterior. But that uncertainty we've got that was driven by the missing data, it's just folded directly into the posterior. And we can draw from it, we can make inferences from it exactly as we can do in all semester. Um, so the BRM multiple function, once we've run a mice imputation, can just take it directly and iterate over it. Now, I do wanna say for, for frequentist models, the typical uh, advice for the number of imputations to run is like 10. Right? If you have more missing data, you should run more imputations. It's a rule of thumb. There's not a great defense for that. In a Bayesian context, um, you want to run more because we want to simulate that um, posterior sampling process for the missing data. So uh, there's uh, one paper I've seen on it that Stefan Buren cites to defend the method. He's the author of BRMS. Um, and the advice that that paper gives is around 100 is a good number of imputations to run. Right, because we really do want to fully explore the possible space for those missing values. And with about 100 draws, we're going to get a better idea of the shape of the distribution of those missing values than we would with only 10. Right, 10 draws is not enough to draw a density, but 100 gets close. Now, again, that can get computationally intensive if we have a lot of data, but that's okay. For most applications, it won't be too bad. Okay, so measurement error, just to summarize, today's lecture, right? Measurement error is a super important part of the data generating process, and ignoring it assumes that you've got perfect measurement, 
and uh, assuming you have perfect measurement when you don't is just lying, right? Um, so it can bias your inference and it can understate your uncertainty. So if you have measurement error, address it. If you have missing data, um, explain what you think the process is that drives the missingness and defend your choices, right? Listwise deletion can be defensible when you have missing completely at random data, but it is indefensible in any other context, right? Uh, and missing completely, you know, uh, the data, the, the process that generates missing data is going to be an assumption on your part. A reasonable, a reasoned assumption, but an assumption. Um, at best, you're throwing away information. At worst, you're biasing inference. Um, so missing, if you have missing data, you need to think about why it's missing, and you need to think about what the appropriate solution is to address it. If you have measurement error, you should fold in the information you have about the error in your data into the estimation procedure. Um, the only time we kind of are screwed and can't really use the data is when missing this is correlated with the outcome based on either just the, the outcome itself is inducing missingness or some unobservable uh, variable is inducing missingness. Then it's going to be really hard for us to use the data to learn anything. Um, uh, and that's a case where you, you might need new, new data. There's not much statistically we can do at that point. Um, OK, so I hope this has been useful. Uh, I, I, here's some further reading on, on mice. Uh, the vignettes are great. And the BRMS uh, has, has, BRMS has a vignette for missing this that I would also recommend you work through if you're going to use these. Um, but you know, I want to say thank you for a really wonderful semester. Um, and I appreciate you kind of being willing to work through this very difficult material with me, right? This was the first time I've taught base. Um, I think it went pretty well. I think there are some things I'll shift up, maybe switch over to the RMS earlier in the semester next time, um, once we get our head around the model specifications. But um, I hope you found this to be worthwhile. And please do use the course evals to tell me you know, what did or didn't work, or just shoot me an email. Um, you know, and as you're developing your own research, uh, using these tools, I you know want to be a resource available to you. So please do drop me a line if um, you would like some advice on methods that you're thinking about for your own empirical papers or dissertations as you as you move forward with this stuff. I am around. Um, anyway, yeah, thanks, thanks again. I hope everyone stays safe and stays well. Are there any kind of last questions on today or anything else? Um, or so if, yeah, go ahead. Well, if you don't mind, uh, after we, the, you're finished here, I, I need some help with the reinstallation. I had to reinstall my computer. Uh, okay, I can stay on the line for a second after. So, uh, other questions? I was just wondering if we can um, like continue using the Slack as a resource for each other if we have um, coding issues to help each other out. Yeah, I'll keep it open. Cool. And I, I, you know, I'll do my best to address questions in a timely way as they come on. I get notifications when it posts. So yeah, I'll keep it open. Thank you. Yep. I may kind of, I've been using Slack for all the stats courses. I may just create a master one at some point that like everyone who's been through any of the courses can jump in that might be useful for homework. So potentially next year you could help first years with homework assignments if you really are feeling eager about it. Um, because we may be remote and you know knocking on doors won't be a thing potentially. Um, okay, yeah, other thoughts or questions? Okay, I'm gonna close it out with that, Oren, I'll stick around for a second, uh, but have a great uh, rest of your semester and um, stay safe, stay well, take care of yourselves. I'll post grades ASAP um, and no one should